Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. This is Deb Philman at The Reason We Learn. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about the San Diego Unified School District and some changes they've recently made to their grading system. First, have a look at the local news station and what they had to say about it, interspersed with a few comments of my own. There is mounting opposition to a new grading policy approved by the San Diego Unified School District that aims to be more equitable. NBC7's education reporter Rory Devine is here with why some parents think it won't serve anyone better. Under the old grading policy, the vast majority of failing grades went to minority students. So as one board member put it, to be an anti-racist district, changes have to be made. Did you catch it? To be an anti-racist district, changes have to be made. Now, people on both sides of this issue get it, but they say, is changing the grading policy the way to do it? This is not serving the best interests of the students. Kevin Crown is a professor at La Mesa College. His son, Ryan, is a sophomore in high school. I think it's a good idea. I'm pleased to hear that we're more focused on whether or not a student is actually learning and mastering the material. Did you hear what he said? He said he's glad to hear they're going to be focused on students mastering the material. Sounds good, doesn't it? I understand this whole idea of, of equity, but what does that do for those students who are already putting in the effort, they're working really hard, they're getting their work in on time, and basically it's telling them, it's like, why am I trying so hard? If you're doing well, this won't affect you. If you're doing well, this won't affect you. But if your child happens to be one of those kids who's having a hard time, they might not be left behind. Lori Devine, NBC7. Okay, now that you've watched that, let's take a closer look at the policy. Before we do though, let's talk about anti-racism. What is anti-racism? The video said, it goes without saying, that they have to change it. Changes must be made because we have to be a more anti-racist school district. Now, I'm not in San Diego, so I don't know why I'm saying we, but whatever. Anti-racism, how is that different from non-racist or colorblind or something else, right? Well, anti-racist has its own meaning. It means you're actively working to fight racism. What's the underlying assumption there? That racism is present. Not just present, it's present all the time in every aspect of our lives. It's everywhere. We have to have anti racist everything, and school districts are no exception. So they said, in order to become an anti racist school district, which of course is a foregone conclusion that we have to be, nobody questions this. Why is nobody questioning this? This should be questioned. This, this is the fundamental assumption upon which everything else rests, everything else I'm going to show you rest on this assumption because if you believe that you need to become an anti-racist school district that means you currently believe there is racism pervasive persistent everywhere throughout the district and what that means is that you're going to look at outcomes from the school district differently than you would if you did not assume as a given that it's a racist school district and the Here's the weird part about anti-racism. Anti-racism is an activity. It's the act of fighting of racism, but racism is always there. So this is like San Diego Unified School District saying we're a racist school district. So we must become anti-racist so we can fight our racism. So basically saying we are racist. And in order to fight that, we have to be constantly fighting it. We can't just strive to be a not racist school district and eliminate racism or at least reduce it to the point where it's not an issue. It's not impacting anybody as a system. I mean, you can't get it out of people's heads at the individual person, but you certainly can remove it from the system. No, that's not what they're saying. They're not saying we're going to remove it from the system. They're saying they're going to put into the system practices that will fight it, will duke it out on a daily basis because it's always going to be there. Nothing you can do about it. And of course, when they are saying this to themselves, they're saying this to parents, they're also saying it to their students. And what's the net impact of that? When you tell all the students across an entire district, we're so very sorry we are inherently racist as a district, 
system wide, nothing we can do about it, except fight it to the nail every single day. So with that in mind, with that core assumption in mind, let's take a look at what they're going to do. Their academic grades will now be based on how well a student knows a subject, not on factors related to behavior. Okay, used to be, I thought that grades were a composite of your behavior and your demonstration of your mastery of a subject. So they're saying it will now be based on how well a student knows a subject. Well, what, what was it until now? How were you grading them before? Only on their behavior? Like, oh, yay, you showed up, you sat in the chair, you get a grade. I thought the whole point of grades was to dis decide how well you'd mastered a subject. Now, that doesn't mean I think that grading systems are perfect. That doesn't mean I think that the grade is the most important thing that you get out of going to school or that it's even always an accurate measure of how well you know something. I think we can all agree that's not always the case. And there are probably some tweaks we could make to grading systems. And there are even some things in here that I don't think are terrible. But this seems to be saying from now on, it's going to be based on how well you know a subject. Okay. Starting this school year, San Diego Unified will eliminate non-academic factors such as student behavior from academic grades following a unanimous vote by the school board Tuesday to overhaul the district grading practices. Non-academic behaviors. What are non-academic behaviors? Are we talking about how they act in the class, like whether they're unruly or speaking out of turn, not raising their hand, showing up late, or what? Like, what is an academic behavior? No explanation. The changes are partly to address racial and other disparities in current grading practices. Notice they say practices, not results. They didn't say results, they said practices. So are they saying the teachers are looking at the grades going, well, you're white, so you get um, a C or above, and you're black, so maybe not. Is that what they're saying? I don't think that's what they're saying. I certainly hope not, but then again, they've already admitted that they're a racist school district, so who knows? I mean, anything is possible. District data have shown that Black, Hispanic, Native American, and Pacific Islander high school students are significantly more likely to be given Ds and F grades, D and F grades, given, to be given. So again, I'm picturing the racist school district, the racist teacher with a big pot of grades and the practices, uh, the grading practices are racist, so you get a lower grade because you are black. That's the way they're describing it. That's literally, when you parse the words here, that's what they are saying. I, I don't think that's what they mean, but I mean, why choose these words? Practices, given, no, no one's earning these, they're just handed out. Okay, black students received D or F grades 20% of the time, and Hispanic students received them 23% of the time. Well, white students, capitalized for some reason, received them 7% of the time, and Asian students received them 6% of the time, according to data from the first semester of last school year. The district-wide average for D and F grades was 16%. Interestingly, they say the district-wide average, that means like across all the demographics, I'm assuming, 16% of the total student body is getting Ds and Fs? Okay, but let's look at these numbers, because this is a framing issue here. They received D or F grades 20% of the time. Hmm, you know what that means? They received C or above 80% of the time. Yeah, interesting how when you frame it in the negative, it seems really dire. But when you look at 80%, you think to yourself, that's a lot. It's like eight out of 10 kids is getting a C or above. That's actually pretty decent. It's pretty good, right? Especially since we don't know the breakdown. We don't know of those 80% of black students, how many are getting A's with the current system, the current racist system? Still 80% of the black students are getting A, B, or C. And like I said, we don't know how many, are they all C's, are they A's and B's? We have no idea. Those 93% of white students who are getting C's or above's, are they all C's? Because then it's not all that awesome if let's say the 80% of the black kids are getting A's. I mean, we don't know. <laughs> we just don't know. They could be 
on par with each other in terms of how many of their larger set are getting C's and B's and A's, you could have much closer to parity there. And so then you have 20% who are outliers and maybe the 20% have more in common with the 7% as well. We don't know because this has been presented to us as, see these numbers, this number is bigger than this number, that's bad. And it's bad because racism. <laughs> that's, that, that's what we're being told. And we're supposed to accept that. Okay. And there's intent behind it. See, racism. It, I mean, I would think, or maybe it's just the critical race theory idea that it's not, it doesn't have to be intentional. If it just results that way, if it just happens that way, that's just racism. It's evidence of racism. And if you deny it, you're racist. Don't forget. Okay, meanwhile, students with disabilities and English learners were given DNA. Why are we talking about disabilities in the same context as race? Pretty sure race is not a disability. Pretty sure disability is special needs and they have whole separate issues. So why are we even talking about them? I guess this grading system will affect them too, but uh, I don't think it's anything to do with racism. Experts, teachers, and students have said that including non-academic factors into grades and not giving students second chances to learn or make progress can contribute to unfair disparities in grades. So what they're telling us now is that when you include non-academic factors, this is the behavior stuff, this is like their fancy schmancy way of saying when you include poor classroom behavior, let's get, let's cut to the chase. When you include that and when you don't give students second chances to learn or make progress, which as a teacher, I'm going to guess that means when they fail something the first time, you don't let them retake the test or you don't let them have extra time to do the assignment or whatever. It contributes to unfair disparities in grades. Does it contribute to unfair disparities in grades? What's about the student's own activity? What about their effort? Where does that come in? So when you, the school, don't do these things and when you, the teacher, don't do these things, you're being racist, apparently, because the kids who are needing these things are more often than not black or Hispanic or Native American, I guess, but they're really focusing on, on black, then you're doing something bad. They're, they're just the innocent recipient of all of this. And that's why we put it as non-academic factors. If we were to put it in there as, have said that including classroom behavior, have said that you know not allowing kids to redo work they turned in really late or never bothered to turn in or turned in with you know not knowing the information so and I, I don't mean to paint such a negative picture but I'm trying to show you how framing makes a difference and how you present this information and there are underlying assumptions under here that we need to look at for example a student may have struggles related to home or other responsibilities that impact their ability to turn in work on time or learn content before a test I'm sure guess what that cuts across all demographics yes all kinds of kids have home problems, responsibilities, things that impact their ability to work on time and learn content before a test. It's just that some actually work to overcome that, some from all races, by the way. Remember those 80%? I really don't want to let them get forgotten in this whole conversation. Please keep them in your mind. The 80% of the black students who are achieving with this horrendously racist, terrible system of regular grades. Common grading practices such as averaging a student's grade over time can disadvantage students who started the year behind grade level and can discredit the process, the progress a student has made, experts have said. Well, that's true. That's true. I mean, if you started off behind grade level and you made a dramatic improvement and you average the grade across the year, the average is going to be lower than it would be if you looked at them separately. But you didn't go to school separate. You went to school across the whole year. But guess what? Guess what? If you grade on a quarter system or a semester system or even a trimester system, you will see, you'll see that incremental improvement. Colleges look at that. People look at that. They see that. They see your transcript. They see if it went up. Happened to me. When I applied to college, they said, oh, what tremendous improvement you made in math. That's excellent. That shows you really stuck to your guns and you really tried and you worked hard. Yeah, and I did. And I really liked getting that feeling of accomplishment that I started down here and I worked my way up here and I could measure it. I could see the trajectory. But see, when you don't have a trajectory, you don't have a down, you don't have an up. When you have mastery, it's all flat. With the new 
policy adopted Tuesday. Academic grades will only be about showing progress toward mastery of standards rather than rewarding students for completing a certain quantity of work. That's not what grades do. They don't say you completed this block of work, you get a grade. No, it's you completed it and you mastered it well enough to pass a test or get this many right out of instead of wrong. You demonstrated mastery, didn't you? Or competency or something with it. That's how you got the grade. It didn't just materialize because you checked a bunch of boxes and you completed a bunch of stuff. In fact, the opposite is more true. To say that a student has achieved mastery of certain material just means that they're performing at grade level. Standards-based means you have to hit this standard to be at grade level. Standard is the key word there. It's not just a standard in terms of everyone has to learn this stuff. It's standard in terms of this is the aver- this is how average people do. What we used to call a C, average, right? But we don't use that anymore. Now we just say mastered. To me, that's a bastardization of the word mastered. And are we using that word now? I thought we did away with it because of master bedroom and master. But anyway, standards-based is grade level. Grade level doesn't tell you you mastered anything. It just said you hit where the average person in a public school would be for this level. So remember those 80% who were C or above? They're now going to only be evaluated as being here along with the 20% who will be evaluated as being here. Equity! Yay! We all did it in the same place. Are we happy? Guess what? You go out and live in the world alone. You go out and get a job alone. You go out and earn your living alone. You have to survive on your own after 18 alone. You have to impress upon an employer that you, you individually can do stuff, not compared to anybody else. So the great thing about those individual grades combined with your behavior and your personal qualities and your values and all the things that non-academic stuff that went into your grade before is that it was a way of letting other people know when you got that grade we used to have an, a, a shared understanding as a society i have a high school diploma that means something to your future employer or your future college now it's like i performed at grade level mm-hmm. same as 99 percent of my class because we adjusted everything downward and jerry-rigged it such that everyone would be mastering. How are you different from them? Don't know. Not sure. Not really sure. Don't know. I wasn't really allowed to be different. Difference. Not cool. Because that's not equity. You see what I'm saying? So where, do, where are the arenas now that they can differentiate themselves and excel? He's academically inclined. And that's okay. I mean, maybe somebody doesn't want to go to college. Wow, what a concept. Remember vocational technical training? Let's bring that back. Yeah, telling kids that everyone needs to go on the same path towards college and that that somehow is equity is selling them a bill of goods. That's why we have so many kids with insurmountable college debt begging for it to be forgiven because they didn't get a job that could even come close to making them enough money to pay off the debt. And so they're working in a job that will never afford them that ability. They're bitter, they're they're upset and I'm sorry, I don't completely blame them. I don't think we should pay off their debt because there are plenty of people who didn't go to college who went to trade school or went and got a job and went to work or started a company. And why should they have to pay for somebody else's, you know, falling for a bad deal? I mean, it's unfortunate. I don't blame them for being angry, but they need to go to the college that sold them the bill of goods and maybe to the high school and the guidance counselor that pushed them into it. And look at the people who are actually guilty for putting them on that path. Okay, N- not the rest of us. We didn't do it. You know, maybe throw in some blame for the government that made it look like everything else was a dead end. Anyway, I digress. Rather than getting one chance to get a good grade, students will be given additional chances to revise their work and show improvement. See, they're not going to be docked anymore for turning in academic grades or work late or other factors related to work habits. These aspects of student behavior will be judged in a separate citizenship grade. What does that mean? I don't know. It's not really detailed. I'm sure it's somewhere in the explanation, which I did look up, by the way. Let's see. What did I find? Oh, my God. Tiny print and my terrible old eyes. Hmm. See, they should be, you know, they've got all this stuff. They're in the process of editing this. Actually, I don't even think that this is up to date because it still lists letter grades. 
okay? So they have meeting content area standards, approaching content area standards, beginning progress towards content area standards. These are still letter grades. So I'm not sure this is even the new policy. This, oh, here we go, look, not assessed, incomplete. This is what I think they used to have. Oh no, here's citizenship. Consistently exceeds expectations in work completion, preparation, and participation, and actively contributes to the learning experiences of their peers. Why is that somebody else's problem? Why do you have to actively contribute? Can you just not get in the way? Can you just not disrupt other people? Or is that what we're calling it now? <laughs> is not disrupting now called contributing? Might be, actually. Consistently meets expectations, completes work on time, prepares to learn, prepared to learn, participates regularly, shows respect for others, and contributes to building a positive community. So you see what I mean about how the standard of mastery or meeting expectations is what we would, most of us old farts, would consider the bare minimum. Don't you agree that the bare minimum is completing work on time? being prepared to learn, like showing up with a pencil and paper in your books and participating regularly. I mean, yeah, you can make a little leeway there. Showing respect for others. This is a, this is a goal. <laughs> so, you know, yay. And that gets you a three and then four would be exceeds. This is the same thing my daughter had actually. They had the whole threes and fours thing and they'd get all excited if they got a four because almost nobody got a four. I mean, getting a four was like, whoa, you know, the heavens opened. It was really, really rare. They held back on giving those out because they wanted the majority of students to get threes. And I'm not even 100% sure we'd ha what you'd have to do to get a four. But see here where they have these incomplete, in progress, no credit, pass, no pass. This must be for the pass fail that they're going to implement. And then we have the meeting content area standards. But notice it's still an A, B, C, or D. So we're not really getting rid of letter grades. They're just not doing it with numbers. So meet, meeting content area standards is a B. That used to be a C for those playing at home. C was average. C was, you know, you, you did the work at the grade level. That's average work because the grade level is average. It's how they establish the grade level in the first place. B was above average typically. And that's kind of ingrained in most people's minds. Now B is what C used to be. It's kind of like how a zero is what a two used to be, or more like a four, and now we have all this vanity sizing of double zero. It's the same thing with grades. This is grade inflation. This is grade inflation. A is exceeding content area standards. They're making an A not that much better than a B is what they've done. They're sort of degraded A, which used to be excellent because B was already above average. So A was excellence. Now B is exceeds, you've exceeded. We don't know by how much. So here I met the grade level standard, which isn't much, it's bare minimum, right? Look at me, I got an A. That's not what it used to be. So imagine you're a kid in that 80% of the black students who's currently getting above a C, who's getting an A. I don't know how many of the, of the 80%, but let's say some. Imagine you're one of them. Imagine you're any of the other kids getting A's today that are actually A's because they're 90 or above. I think it's like 91 or 92, but 90 above. That's tough. That's tougher than I got a B. I, got, I met the standards and then I did a little bit better. Now I have an A. It's just not really the same thing. It's just not. I'm sorry. So, you know, I, okay, let's go back, shall we? So the idea that you can make a mistake and go back and fix it is powerful and allows kids to learn and grow in a more rep reparative and less punitive environment. Again, we're assuming that something is wrong with the relationship between the kid and the school and not necessarily between the kid and learning in general, the kid and themselves, the kid and, you know, it, it seems to be like the onus is on the school and not just the school, but all the other students to participate in repairing this broken situation. Okay, the, it's, it's less on the individual child. We are gradually pulling away responsibility from individuals. And this is how we do it. Given, grades are given, not earned. And the 20% of the black students are not doing as well as the 80%, so everybody has to change. We have to revise everything downward. Uh, let's see, I showed you the credit, no credit. Um, Typically, grading is often arbitrary and differs widely from one teacher to another. Um, 
okay, how is this going to change that? Academic marks will be based on the competi compet <laughs> competency level, I can't even talk, of each student and subject area as it relates to content standards. Students shall achieve the level of meeting content area standards by the end of the grading term when final grade mark is recorded, et cetera, et cetera. So how exactly is this going to be less arbitrary? We have a set of standards established by a group of people, a school board, Department of Education, et cetera. Parents are disconnected from that. You could probably go look at the arcane little, you know, lists of things and see whether they're able to achieve this. And it's and they make it so tiny with you know every last little detail of what they should be able to do that unless you're a parent looking at the work product and you know exactly where those align with the standards, I mean, I do, and I still found it difficult. Okay, and you you know you'd have to look at that to align the work your child's work product with the outcome, and even then it'd get meet standards, and you're like, hmm. Okay, <laughs> it, 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 it's so de-individualized that you don't really get a great picture of what your own child is doing. So if that's important to you as a parent, and if it's important to you as a child, you're not going to get it. And I think we're missing the component that grades provide the individual student with information about how you're doing. So you can decide, do I want to continue in my academic career? Or maybe this isn't for me. Just a thought. Okay, and we've been for too long on, the, uh, on this idea that when you, ha you had a chance, you didn't succeed, so therefore we're going to categorize you as a failure and your option is to start all over. What? There are certain people who, yeah, they, they failed school because they just didn't show up and they didn't do any of the work and life is gonna categorize that person as a failure. So isn't it better in a safe environment for them to learn what behaviors are associated with failing at life and what behaviors are associated with succeeding at life? And there are certain minimum basic expectations. So that's still gonna continue when I showed you the grades. There's still gonna be people who don't meet the expectations. This is all a lot of fancy words, a lot of fancy ways to say, we're, we're giving them all these chances, we're making things better, we're helping people who need help, but they're still revising it downward. When you look at the details, they're still making an A what used to be a B and a B what used to be a C. There's no other, I mean, there's literally no other way to sugarcoat that, though they are trying. I will give them credit. They were trying really hard. This goes on to talk about how they're going to do away with zero tolerance policies for cheating. They're going to implement it if you see something, say something policy. One of the students said that's not a great idea. It's like a student ambassador to the board that's, and he's right. It's going to cause bullying. So there's, they said they'd reconsider that because what's it going to be? I accuse. And therefore, we know how that goes in our society, right? Um, and the other thing they're going to do, which I don't like, is they're making, they're creating a punishment. And the student complained about that as well. They might revisit it. Who knows? They're going to make a punishment for parents and students. This is really punishing a student for what the parent does, by the way. If you go to the teacher to ask them to revise a grade, and it's not a clerical error. Well, why would it be a clerical error? Because there's no more number calculations anymore. It's all, I decided that you met the expectations based on what I saw in the work product the parent never gets to look at. So if a kid goes home and says, "This I got ripped off. I should have had a meets expectations, but I didn't. Or I should have had an exceeds, but I didn't. And I think, I think it's bogus. And I can guarantee you that's going to happen. Like I said, there were almost no fours in my daughter's school. And I know for a fact that some kids did four work because I've tutored them, so I know they're capable of it. So, you know, let's say they go in and say, no, I, I really, I looked at the rubric and this, this was a four. You're gonna get dinged on your citizenship grade. They're going to punish you for trying to individuate, for trying to excel, for tr going to the teacher and say, what can I do to make this better? Now, if you fell below and you have all these extenuating circumstances and you know, you didn't show up at class and you didn't do work and it was late and all these other things. Oh, they'll give you chance after chance after chance after chance without you asking. You don't have to ask, they're gonna give it to you, like they give you your grades. But if you go and say, I did work, and I did this and I challenged this. And as the student pointed out, this is supposed to be a district that values self-advocacy. So, this rounds out with AP, a discussion of AP classes, and they're going to allow them to take classes across the district from one source, and it's online and all that, and that's all well and good. But let me tell you how this might be affected by this new policy. In the past, you had to achieve at least like a B plus or 
mostly A's to go into AP classes. Your guidance counselor, or even the teachers would just say, don't bother. It's college level work. So what you're doing is you're trying to demonstrate to your future college, you can do college level work before you get there so you can get college credit before you get there. Save time, save money, move on. I did it. I was taking sophomore classes my freshman year. But it's hard. It's really, really hard. It's college level work. Tons of reading, tons of writing, and you gotta go fast. We're talking like 100 pages a night kind of reading. So with this meets expectations, if unless they, and I don't know if they're doing this, unless they make it, you still have to exceed expectations, which as we previously discussed is difficult to do, I'm imagining. If you do that, unless you do that, you are not gonna make it through an AP class. And my concern with this is it'll be like the district here, where they let anybody who met expectations go take AP if they just wanted to. They made it their choice. And this class got held back by all the kids who really should not have been there. They didn't finish the class and it is a test prep class. Let's remember that. AP test is the whole point of it. It's not just like I learned. No, you have to actually pass a test or you don't get the credit. And by pass, I mean get almost a perfect, I mean you have to get a four or above and it goes up to five. You can't get a three, you just, there's no point. So you have to finish the material so you can go take the test. And I tutored a girl who three quarters way through the year was told they weren't even halfway through the material because they had to go at such a slow pace. So if you don't allow them the opportunity to do this and perform at that level, they're not going to make it through the class. And the classes are expensive in terms of the test you have to take and then a lot of people end up paying for tutors and it's a pain. You're supposed to be able to get that out of your school for free because you pay taxes, right? I mean, it's not free, but you know. Anyway, that's what's going on. And what I think is happening is this is all part of the grand plan, which is um, teach our kids they're not individuals, they're members of, of demographics. The demographic that is most put upon is black in this anti-racist mold. And we must be constantly vigilant. And constant vigilance means taking anyone who's doing well, even within the black community, down a peg. But the presumption is because a higher percentage of white people are doing well, we, they'll come down faster and farther. And equity is the goal. Everybody being the same is a goal. Bye-bye individualist education. Bye-bye individuals. Bye-bye individual achievement. Where is that? Where is individual achievement in there? Meets expectations a B. So you can say, I met expectations and you're the same as everybody else and you got to be. What does that tell the college? How are they going to pick people? And the reason that I think this is so damaging I really do. I mean, I can make a whole other video about it, and I probably will, but I want to read you something really quick. I have to get my book. This is called Learned Optimism. This book was written, I think, in the 80s. But this is by Martin Seligman. He is the father of cognitive behavioral therapy. And you're thinking, why are you talking about therapy in the middle of a talk about grading? Well, because this is a very pessimistic outlook on the problem. The problem is that a percentage of students in each of these demographics is not achieving at grade level. They're D or below, okay, they're failing. So the approach is change the whole system because it must be racism. That's the only way we can fix it. We can, certainly can't go to the individual students and help them. It's not temporary, it's not specific. There's nothing we can do about it. So we have to fix the whole thing. And here's the problem with that. We're killing hope. We're not teaching children how to hope or be resilient. Here's what he says. Hope has largely been the province of preachers and politicians and of hucksters. The concept of explanatory style bringing hope into the laboratory where scientists can dissect it in order to understand how it works. Whether or not we have hope depends on two dimensions of our explanatory style, pervasiveness and permanence. Finding temporary and specific causes for misfortune is the art of hope. Temporary causes limit helplessness in time and specific causes limit helplessness to the original situation. On the other hand, permanent causes produce helplessness far into the future and universal causes spread helplessness throughout all your endeavors. Finding permanent and universal causes for misfortune is the practice of despair. What has this told us? Racism is permanent. It is the cause of everything that doesn't go right in your life. There's nothing you can do about it if you are the designated victim. You must rely on white people to change it and adjust their expectations, adjust their behavior. You are learning to feel despair and helplessness and hopelessness. And how does this help anyone? 
How does this help the individual student? How does this help the community if we're going to be all collectivist about this? I maintain it doesn't. So that's my biggest problem with it, is this entire thing is built on a lie. So whether you can find tidbits that are good about, you know, recognizing improvement and giving kids a second chance to take a test. Yes, there are little things in there, which guess what? Good teachers have always done that. Good teachers have always made exceptions, have always gotten to know their individual students, have always taken extenuating circumstances into account and have always, always recognized improvement. Good teachers have always done that. They didn't need to revamp the entire system. They just needed to better train teachers and encourage more teachers to be like those good teachers and reward those good teachers who behaved like individuals, not like cogs in a union machine, who needed the district to tell them to do everything the same, which by the way is also designed to take teachers down a peg who are trying to excel and do things in an individualized way because it makes the others look bad. I know that from personal experience. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you found this content helpful interesting, informative, entertaining, whatever. But if you did, I hope that you will like this video, share this video, subscribe to my channel, and click the notification bell to be notified when I make another video. And until next time, see ya.